evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Colin Forrest. I'm one of the members of the Council of the Queensland Chapter of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And I begin tonight firstly by acknowledging the um, traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Turubal and Yagara people, and pay respects on behalf of all of us to their, uh, and to their ancestors, to their current uh, leaders and their elders and their future elders. I think I'm supposed to say to their elders past, present, and future. But I don't think it matters if you get the wording a little bit mixed up. Now, um, thank you for coming along tonight. I'm, some of you may have already read this on our promotional website, but I sort of feel like I need to, you know, bring the, bring, bring the start of the event onto us with a crescendo. So Australia's ambitions for global climate policy leadership have been seriously undermined in recent years. Don't we know it? Its reputation reduced by political inertia, policy blind spots and diplomatic isolation. At the same time, Pacific Island nations have gained global traction. Their leaders, recognising the influence of their regional voice and collective action in the drive to shape international law. These nations have called out Australia's poor performance and questions its credibility within the Pacific family. Climate crisis now demands a new approach to regional cooperation in Oceania and a fundamental reordering of strategic priorities. It may also require a new set of diplomatic skills and tradecraft until Australia demonstrates that it is serious about tackling the climate crisis, it will struggle to pursue strategic interests in the Pacific. Now, our two esteemed speakers tonight have brought together diverse Australian and Pacific Island voices and perspectives in their new book, copies of which we have for sale, which you can buy after you've heard them speak, if you wish. Their new book is called Climate Politics in Oceania. It reflects on the shifting debates and it highlights the potential for Australia to engage constructively, not just by wearing lays, but constructive engagement with regional partners to secure Oceania's interests. I had to borrow that from Paul Keating. <laughs> Whatever you think of Paul Keating, he's got a way with words. Um, that uh, it, this book is about uh, the potential for Australia to engage constructively with regional partners to secure Oceania's interests now in the future. The authors say Canberra must embrace the opportunity while it still can. Now, to introduce you to the authors, Professor Caitlin Byrne, is known to many of us here at AIIA, is the Pro Vice Chancellor of Business at Griffith University. She provides strategic oversight to the delivery of the university's business education and scholarship. Formerly a diplomat with the Australian Government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and has worked across senior leadership roles in government, industry and community. As the director of the Griffith Asia Institute, Professor Byrne has established a reputation of one of Australia's leading academic practitioners focused on international policy and diplomatic practice. Now, our other guest speaker tonight, Professor Susan Harris Rimmer, has an amazing job. She leads the climate justice theme of the Griffith Climate Action Beacon. That's a, that's a mouthful to say. <laughs> what do you do? I won't even try it again. Uh, that's at Griffith University. It focuses on human rights compliant climate adaptation strategies for a fair transition. Professor Harris Rimmer is the director of the university's policy innovation hub and a human rights lawyer and policy expert, has created the Climate Justice Observatory to examine extreme heat and human rights in Queensland and is, and is the founder of the Every Gen Coalition, which lobbies for a legislative commitment to protect the rights of future generations in Australia. How admirable. Welcome tonight, and we really look forward to hearing you talk about your book. Um, thank you so much for coming, everyone, uh, for braving the weather, braving the water. We're really grateful. Um, I, too, would also like to pay my respects to our elders um, and to acknowledge the land on, on which we're standing and that, that respect for First Nations wisdom and traditional knowledge is also tried to infuse the book um, and pay particular respects to our First Nations colleagues that work with us on the book. Um, not just from Australia, but also from New Zealand and uh, in the Pacific. So, uh, how did this book come about? Uh, this is <laughs> a work of many years of love and 
uh, hardship during COVID. So uh, basically what happened is Griffith University made a commitment, firstly, to interdisciplinary research. And they said, we will fund a beacon, and the beacon will be uh, interdisciplinary and it will have five years of guaranteed funding and it will have, it will feature research that tries to make a mark in the world and to help um, achieve the sustainable development goals. Go forth, academics, and come up with a genius idea for what one of these beacons might look like. The first of the beacons, there's three of them. One's called Disrupting Violence, one's called Inclusive Futures, which is around disability rights, um, the violence against women and girls, and this one is around climate action. And this one, uh, basically, at the beginning, we said we'll focus on um, understanding why people take climate action or don't take climate action in Australia. We'll focus on how to help sectors transition and we'll also focus on climate justice. And it was a, a big step, I think, for our climate scientists to say, we will have a focus on climate justice and we will bring the humanities and uh, our colleagues uh, in that space into this beacon. Uh, quite a, a risk for those of us who were pretty comfy in our human rights lives, not understanding how the IPCC reports work, so I um, had to retrain and understand climate science as much as I can. So I pay a lot of respect to Professor Brendan Mackey that leads, who's an IPCC lead author that leads the Climate Action Beacon. So the first thing we wanted to do as part of the climate justice team was to think about un unfairness in all, its, in all its manifestations around the climate issue, the unfairness of what's going to happen to young people and what current populations are doing to future populations. The unfairness of what rich countries are doing to poor countries, what rich people inside rich countries are doing to poor people inside those countries. So we wanted to look at kind of manifestations of unfairness. Uh, but because we are also total diplo nerds, Kate and I, um, we wanted to focus on what we know, which is the diplomatic tradecraft. We wanted to really focus on when we thought the Australian diplomacy and tradecraft could look different, particularly in relation to our Pacific neighbours. So if you think of one of the greatest manifestations of climate injustice in the current world, it's what's happening to the Pacific Islands, who are facing existential risk at a very rapid rate. Uh, so not, not, not even discomfort or distress or difficulty, existential risk. Uh, so in, in every format of life, and it looks different in different countries, the Pacific Islands are very diverse, but as a collective, the Blue Pacific have made it very clear that climate risk is their number one concern. And, of course, the unfairness comes from the fact that those Pacific islands make little to no contribution to emissions. So it's really, and have not benefited in any way either from kind of the industrial revolution that caused those, those transitions to a, to a um, major extent. So there's such deep unfairness inside that issue. So we wanted to say, all right, well, we are what you would call, I guess, people who are trying to have practical outcomes with their work. So we thought we will tell Dave about what to do, basically. <laughs> Very nicely, but also depends. Uh, and, you know, actually all of them. Um, so the idea was, let's, uh, this was uh, before, this is 2021. This was before the election. It was in an election year, though. It was very clear what the Pacific Island Forum was saying about climate change and the Globe Declaration, we wanted to say, if the Australian government really listened, what would Australian statecraft look like? If they really took that as their first priority, what would we do differently? So that was the kind of the imaginative place we were putting our academic thought. The next thing was, how are we going to gather together the right group of people? So we, it was very clear that we wanted lots of specific authors, um, that we wanted the perspective to be infused in the book, but we also wanted Australians who were willing to be critical of our own trade craft, state craft, defence policy, maritime policy and so forth. Uh, and I must say we got some pretty amazing people. Uh, so it started with our workshop. We asked um, Dane Meg Taylor to um, provoke, inspire us and provoke us. And she, she definitely did that brilliantly. And she's so sorry she can't be with us tonight. She was hoping to join us um, part of this panel. And she is, of course, um, the preface uh, for this book. So it starts out with, with um, Dane Meg explaining the framing of the Blue Pacific and climate issues. Um, also, because of her, we have uh, dedicated the book to Tony Broom, who was a really amazing um, and, uh, Pacific Island ambassador and diplomat 
an end state person. Uh, it's also dedicated to our beautiful Brenda Brennan Sergeant from the ANU, who was a defence um, defence expert who unfortunately died in the, um, after he had finished his career during the chapter. So very someone. So uh, that's how we started. Um, it basically became a, um, a very interesting group with very vibrant discussion, and we decided that we wanted the, the book to be as as kind of focused as possible. So it has quite a lot of different types of contributions in there. Uh, we have um, a, a climate scientist, Simon Bradshaw, who is the um, Head of Research at Climate Council. To start us off, we have Caitlin's chapter that she's going to tell you all about. Um, we have uh, Wesley Morgan, George Carter and Flory Manoa who are talking about Pacific Island perspectives uh, around climate change and the types of uh, internal work that the Blue Pacific have done to state their um, climate uh, concerns to Australia. Uh, we've got wonderful Tess who's here in the audience and will be asking any difficult questions uh, she'll be answering those. Uh, with uh, Robert Tishkant, Melody and Caitlin again about uh, Chinese engagement, which is such a key issue that we'll talk about in this book. Brendan really talked about strategic and defence policy, and this was before they announced the climate risk assessment uh, that Australia has now done. Um, Melissa Colley Tyler talking about um, development and uh, sort of joined up uh, development uh, to policy and defence. Mark Beeson has a very entertaining chapter about Australia's strategic culture and why it's, why it's failing us on um, dealing with the Pacific. Sandra Tarr, who's a very um, senior um, USP academic, looking at regional security narratives. Um, Beck Strading and Joanne Wallace, who are just about to release their new book, Gert by Sea, which I highly recommend, which is talking about maritime boundaries in the Pacific, so really the law of the sea through a Pacific lens. Um, and finally, for some reason, myself last, I don't know why I did that, uh, but it's about um, international human rights law and the way the Pacific Island nations have been framing and shaping international human rights law in really creative and interesting ways and why Australia should get on board, basically. So that's a bit of an overview of the book. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Caitlin to take you through some of the context um, for when, from 2021 to now. Yeah, thank you so much, Sue. And thank you, Graham and Colin. It's so lovely to be here. It feels like I'm always when I come back to the AIA, I'm among friends and it's lovely to see colleagues in the audience. Poppy, great to see you here. Um, Elise, Helen, Rod, I won't go through everyone by name. Colin, I can see you both. Um, and, and also, can I say, how fantastic to see a young audience that is interested in this topic and congratulations to the AAAA because this is uh, such an important place and space to be thinking about our future and the issues of significance for Australia in the world. So number one, I'm really pleased to be here. Can I say this is a first for me because um, he's going to be awfully embarrassed that I do this. My husband is joining us for the first time <laughs> online. Um, thank you, darling, for seeing me. Uh, what a nice touch. Um, but it, it really is truly wonderful. And I would also like to say, firstly, in, in um, repeating the acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, I want to make a very special shout out, and that is to Tess Newton Kane, who is an author in this volume, and I think who really has, uh, in so many ways, both through the process of this book, but well before that, um, provoked us to think differently about the Pacific and to bring different voices into our conversation about the Pacific. Peter Layton, I can see you too. Uh, also, another <laughs> group of colleagues. Sorry, I'll stop that. Um, <laughs> One of the things I wanted to mention was that between us having our writers' workshop in December 2019, I say, um, to kind of having the idea to put this together as a book, we were we were looking at different formats for bringing this collection together. Um, there was an article produced in uh, the very well-known American journal Foreign Affairs, and it was written by uh, Todd. Um, Got their names here somewhere. Where have I put them? John Podesta and Todd Stern, no strangers to the foreign policy arena in the US. And it was called A Foreign Policy for the Climate. And it had a very stark cover on the cover of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and it was calling for 
the contemplation of a new kind of global leadership that put climate at the centre of foreign policy. And in fact, it was calling for America to reinvigorate its global leadership by putting climate at the centre of its foreign policy. And this, of course, was just before Biden was going to um, take on the role as President of the United States. Ironically, that article began uh, with a description of the bushfires that had ripped through Australia towards the late part of 2019. And that vast destruction, as we know, had captured global attention and ire, providing a really harsh reminder to all of us of the effects of climate change, while shining another light on Australia's very poor standing at that stage in global climate policy. We read that article, and I should also make mention of our third co-editor, Wesley Morgan, Dr Wesley Morgan, who's actually launching with the AIIA in Sydney this evening as well. And we're... we're coast to coast. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, and, that, and reading that article, I think, provoked all of us to, to contemplate what, what, how should we be thinking about this context for Australia and... and would there be an opportunity for Australia to think about putting climate at the centre of our foreign policy? A conversation that inevitably draws some wider themes of national interest and security alongside those the practice of diplomacy and global engagement, but interlinked with the narratives about Australia and the Pacific region. It had seemed that seemed, and Colin, you've read this, this beautifully from the book, that Australia's approach to climate change up until this point, really across the past decade, had largely been characterised by political inertia, blind spots in, in our policy design and delivery, and diplomatic isolation. And I'm nowhere near as, as disciplined as Sue, and I've put all these notes down. I, I promise I won't speak to all of them. But I did want to just give you a sense of some of the policy themes of the moment that we were putting our themes together behind this book. It was early 2020, the debates of climate change were taking off, the fires has, had um, been a global provocation. The Morrison government was grappling with that issue, um, not just the immediate consequences of dealing with communities who were really struggling and had been devastated, but also those broader strategic policy implications and the soft power fallout for Australia globally. The climate culture wars seemed to be heating up. Michael McCormick as deputy leader was referring to anyone who made the link between uh, those fires and, and climate change more broadly as the inner city raving lunatics. And then COVID hit. And so the agenda changed uh, completely again and the nation was consumed with how to deal with the pandemic. Of course, the climate issue didn't go away. Countries across the world were still also dealing with climate policy and making their own ambitious targets and commitments towards net zero. By the close of 2021, Australia's position seemed to be even further away from that of others across the globe. And Professor Robin Eckersley from uh, University of Melbourne wrote about this, talking about Australia's net zero commitment that was launched or announced in late October 21 where then Prime Minister Scott Morrison declared that Australians would set their own path to 2050 and will set it here by Australians, for Australians. There did seem to be somewhat of a tone deafness to that message. It was also the message he took then to COP26 in Glasgow, describing a focus on, tax, on technology, not taxes, as being at the core of the Australian way and while there was not anything particularly wrong with that, technology has to be a particular driver for us in dealing with climate policy going forward. We just didn't have the technology in place and we didn't really have a roadmap to get to that. At COP26, the Morrison government talked about enhancing its contribution to climate finance, in particular directed towards Pacific and Southeast Asian nations. There were significant amounts that were being talked about from 500 million to 2 billion over the next five years. The problem was though, these were below the expectations that the rest of the world had for Australia in terms of responsibility, economic capacity and population. And while those amounts themselves were impressive to a large degree, this was repackaging and repurposing of existing policy commitments. There was very little 
in those announced commitments that was actually directed towards climate projects. The performance of Australia was poor. Um, there's really no getting around it in so many ways. Um, the Climate Action Tracker rated Australia's performance as highly insufficient. The Climate Performance Index had us at seventh last, after Russia, in fact. For the fifth time in that year, we won the Fossil Award, doing the most to achieve the least. Lord John Devon, the UK's Chief Climate Advisor, commented on Australia's performance at the time. It was just a whole series of words, with no understanding of the urgency of what we have to do. Most uh, interestingly, it was Fijian Prime Minister at the time, Frank Bainimarama, who tried a slightly different tactic. And at COP26, after urging Prime Minister Morrison to halve Australians emissions by 2030, handed him a copy of Fiji's Climate Change Act as a guide to a <laughs> uniquely Fijian way of following the science and keeping faith with future generations. And I don't mean to say this to pile on to the Australian government. Morrison was certainly not blind to the Pacific. He had, in 2017, launched the Pacific Step Up. That was an important policy change and, and, and a recalibration of Australia's policy at the time. He talked about Australia as being part of the Pacific family and, in many respects, really tried to drive a policy agenda forward. But at the same time, the government did seem to be looking at the Pacific neighbourhood through that same lens of defence, security and development. I might just make one more comment, Sue, if I can, and, and um, just to kind of fast forward, I guess, to the point at which we were publishing the book, so maybe a year and a bit later. Um, the Albanese government had just won an election. Uh, Albanese had made no secret of the fact that they were putting climate on the agenda for Australia in a number of policy formats. And in doing so, they were catching up in some respects to the rest of the world. After winning the national election in May 2022, um, the government also emphasised the significance of the Pacific to Australia's climate action. In July 2022, newly elected Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese joined Pacific Island leaders in Suva to declare the Pacific is facing a climate emergency that threatens the livelihoods, the security and the well-being of its people and its ecosystems. This was really the first time that Australia officially associated itself Australia, a member of the Pacific Islands Forum, not to forget, with climate emergency warnings and the first time to have done so in alignment with Pacific leaders. But as Andrew Tillett reported in the Australian Financial Review, you could argue that that, that move was still largely symbolic, with the Albanese government standing firm against call from the region and from climate activists to shut down coal mining and gas extraction. Concerned about the potential economic consequences of tackling climate change, Australia had con has consistently, and I'm using Andrew Tillett's words, tried to avoid the costly commitments while continuing to promote its own economic benefit, and in particular, the growing economies, its role in the growing economies in Asia. So we had seen a notable change in the nature and tone of Australia's climate policy rhetoric but I think there were still questions about how we were going to deliver on that climate policy and how Australia was going to actually engage. And I guess that's part of the context behind the book in trying to bring different voices to the fore. And also the reason for the cover, that we wanted to show sort of a, a marked difference in approach, which was one, uh, you know, this is uh, one went straight to the Pacific as one of her first trips. This was one of her first uh, trips. This is, I think, the first female leader of the Pacific Island nation ever. Second? Second. 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 Top three. <laughs> uh, and there's a sort of a gravitas there of uh, showing a different approach to climate policy uh, and a more inclusive approach to climate policy, which is why we were trying to, to go with this. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, great. So, um, I'm glad to actually ask, um, I'm going to ask you to talk about her chapter in a second, but I just thought I'll have a few moments to talk about my own chapter in the book because it's been a while. Um, but I, 
I guess uh, it doesn't, I've been feeling all day that it's quite amazing. We've been talking about the Brisbane Olympics formally, mm -hmm. um, and I just couldn't believe that our climate targets bill is still in the Queensland Parliament, right? So we know that the Queensland, I think it's called the Clean Jobs Bill. Yeah, Clean, clean Energy Jobs. Clean Energy Jobs Bill, something like that. Clean Economy Jobs Bill, it's got jobs in there anyway. Um, so our own quite ambitious targets bill is just now in the Parliament. Um, and I think it's it's quite astonishing to me that even while we could, I think most Australians are kind of vaguely aware of the, the threats to the Pacific, they're probably not as aware of what's happening in the Torres Strait either, for example. Um, and, you know, maybe understanding that these issues are facing Australian citizens right now in various ways. So we've, I'm kind of reflecting on that and I thought I wanted to make a chapter then very hopeful and I think there's something extremely hopeful about the way our Pacific neighbours have been incredibly clever, innovative and brave in navigating the international human rights law system. So in the space of 20 years, um, Pacific Island nations with other actors, often with New Zealand, with Canada, with the Nordics, have basically had the Human Rights Council declare a right to a clean and healthy uh, and safe environment as a human right. That's come from pretty much nowhere, to a acknowledged human right that is now going to be passed in the ACT Chamber of Human Rights as of this week. So we can thank the Pacific Island nations for the, the very fast evolution of that right into something that is actually actionable in an Australian context. Uh, and there will be the chance for Queensland to also think about that right in the context of the review of the Human Rights Act very soon. So that's one thing, but the one I, we've got lots of students here and I, what I've really, it's a bunch of University of South Pacific students, law students, who have been the driving force between an advisory opinion of the ICJ, which is going to occur later this year. How cool is that? A group of USP law students went, you know what we need? We need an ICJ advisory opinion. How do you get one of those? And made it happen from grassroots up. And that's so but uh, again, it wouldn't have happened without the support of their, their member states, their, their nations. But, you know, Australian law professors uh, weren't doing that, weren't able to do that, weren't able to get through the Australian political system to get that sort of outcome. It's really impressive. Um, and that advisory, and that advisory opinions at the ICJ don't always change the world. We've had one on nuclear weapons for some time. Uh, <laughs> But they are powerful and they will start to dictate state practice and start to shape the boundaries of international law. We've also had some really significant um, practice around um, the rights of nature and also the definition of ecocide that's finally been agreed at an international level. These are all things that our Pacific Island ambassadors and diplomats have been working on for a really long time in coalition, always in very deep coalition. You probably know that they had a big impact on the Paris Agreement. Um, that's all outlined in um, in Wes's book, but you probably weren't as aware of the, uh, the crucial uh, moments that they've had in international human rights law, one of which was also around the creation of the first ever special rapporteur on human rights and climate change, which, and the first person in that role uh, was an Australian uh, Kiribati citizen, Ian Fry, who has since got pretty cranky with the UN system, and I don't really blame him, but uh, he was the first in that role, and um, that is a really important precedent to, to think about. So if you can think about a short period of time, that's a lot of impact on a system that's really basically pretty much the same as it was since World War II. Um, very much shaped, the international human rights system is very much shaped by Europe and what happened in Europe and, and the terrible things that happened after the Holocaust. And now it's being shaped by these extinctions of human survival because of climate change. So. There, is, there are things we can do and, and motion that is happening that is really very positive. And it goes to show too, I think people underestimate the Pacific because of the scale of populations. You don't need a large population to have really good ideas. And Australia should know that. We're not that big a country either. Um, New Zealand's always been. You know, New Zealand was in, in charge of the Security Council during the Rwanda genocide and basically stopped many worse things that could have happened from happening. 
You don't have to be a huge country to have a massive impact on international affairs. And so I've always been ambitious for Australia, and we have had moments of real impact uh, in the world of human rights and in the world of uh, security. Uh, in our, uh, our term in the Security Council, uh, in our work in the Human Rights Council. And yet, in this issue, we have been actively useless. Um, not always blocking, but usually not supporting. So we do often help our Pacific Island neighbours uh, with kind of space and assistance in New York when they're at the UN. But other than that, we have not been particularly active. And there's so much more we could have done. We could have also been at the forefront of, you know, creating a world that thinks about climate change through a human rights lens. Because guess what? Australia is on the front lines of climate change and it's going to affect us very rapidly and it's affecting many members of the population already in terms of particularly far north Queensland and the Torres Strait. So you heard the Climate Justice Observatory before. Our modelling says that by 2050 there will be 100 extra days of extreme heat in the Torres Strait. It's going to be basically unlivable for large periods of the year. Um, and it's dreadful. We'll have a federal court case coming down soon that's going to talk about um, Queensland and the federal government's liability for what's happened to the Torres Strait. They've already complained to the Human Rights Council at the Committee of Human Rights in Geneva and they've had a finding in their favour. So we've already had a finding that Australia has breached the right to life of our Torres Strait Island citizens. And where is that in the news? Where is that in the career of our Rio? These are Queensland citizens who have basically lost their right to water um, and clean water um, and, a, and a livable area as well as serious problems with their right to culture. So what's going on here? Why aren't we having these conversations um, about, you know, climate justice, about what's going to happen to, uh, you know, ideas about um, forced movement and migration? And when we do have those conversations, they're framed incorrectly. So Meg says in here the two biggest issues for the Pacific are geopolitics and climate change. They came together in the Bellapilly um, Declaration. This is the, the, the agreement between Australia and Tuvalu around uh, uh, visas for climate effects. Um, so people could come to Australia. But on the other hand, there's all sorts of defence and security uh, issues with that agreement. And there were some serious issues around the way the agreement was decided. Uh, and so you get this kind of framing all the time around national security issues and China as opposed to our solidarity with our neighbours as neighbours. It's, it's always seen as a sort of asymmetric kind of relationship. We saw it again today, if you're reading the interpreter, um, our Minister Matt Keogh has been talking about this brilliant idea to allow Pacific Islanders into the Australian Defence Force because we don't have enough, we don't have enough people to walk this, basically. So the idea is to sign up for Pacific Islanders um, and because Fijians, I think, already can join the British Army, so why wouldn't they join the Australian um, Defence Force? Uh, and in return, you know, that'll be great for Pacific Islanders. You know, they'll be ready for AUKUS. And, no. <laughs> so in the, in the interpreter, there's an idea of maybe we need a climate defence force. Maybe we need a civilian-led, even rights-led, real action on climate change, and maybe Australia is just never going to have the kind of credibility we want to have while we keep approving coal mines. So we might be hosting the COP soon, and we might be hosting in Brisbane uh, the year after next. So it will be in Baku, then Brazil, and then it may be here. We'll be able to find that out very soon. We're still waiting for Turkey to get out of that way. <laughs> Uh, and if we host COP, it's likely to be in Brisbane and it will be in combination with Australia and Pacific Islands. What would Australia have to do to be a good partner in that COP, if we host that COP? That is the question. So part of what this book is trying to do is say, this is the type of partner we have to be for that event to be successful and to have credibility. So that's, that's where we're at. So basically, the, it's got a lot better since we first started the book. But it's still not where we quite need to be. So we're trying to be hopeful and constructive about the way we can be a bit better. So we're at now. Caitlin, do you want to tell us about your? So I'm going to. I'll I'll do just very briefly, and I'll check on time because I know there's 
Please check it on the question. All right. There may be questions. Yes. I'm going to take us back in time because part of um, the questions I had around Australia's diplomacy were really around where has this come from? Where has our legacy of, of diplomacy come from when we talk about our engagement in um, global climate politics? Where did it all start and how and why? Um, and it started with an environment ambassador, and, and we still have an environment ambassador today, um, climate change ambassador today. But I was really interested in the beginnings of that. So, I, 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 and I think there are some interesting findings, particularly for those interested in diplomacy and tradecraft, around this particular role. It's a special role. Australia actually uh, appointed its first ever ambassador for the environment. 30, well, over 30 years ago in 1989. Anyone know who that was? No? Pretty cool. It will be a name that is familiar to many of you here in the room. It was a position taken up by former High Court Judge and Governor General, Sininian Stevens. It was an appointment that surprised not only you in this room, it surprised many at the time, and it surprised him in, if you read, <laughs> but when you think about it, there, you know, there were some reasons why I think he, he made a, a, an excellent first environment ambassador. But it represented for Australia a really important juncture in Australian diplomacy in how we looked to international cooperation on environmental issues and, and for those issues, playing a new kind of role in the nation's foreign policy. When he announced the role, Prime Minister Bob Hawke at the time flagged his vision for Australia to lead faster international action to preserve the environment and to address forces, including global warming, induced by the greenhouse, greenhouse effect, the loss of biodiversity, transnational pollution, and waste disposal and the exploitation of the world's oceans and fisheries. And he noted at the time the dual purpose of this ambassadorial role was really about giving Australia a stronger, clearer voice on environmental issues, global environmental issues, and to have a strong and consistent capacity to be represented geez, in the increasing rounds of international negotiations and forums that would characterise the nation's involvement on these issues. There's no question this was a special appointment. The Ambassador for, an, for the Environment is a unique role in the international system. It falls into the category of a special interests ambassador, one who is specially appointed to represent the nation on important international issues. But it's not a traditional ambassadorial role. Firstly, those ambassadors that hold these kinds of titles tend to be um, not accredited to another state. So they're actually roaming ambassadors. Um, they, they roam the world and they're usually based at home with those roaming responsibilities. By virtue of the policy focus of their remit, they have to respond not just to the kind of international dynamics and representational requirements of the role, they actually have to respond to domestic stakeholders across industry, academia, media and community and be accountable to a variety of political masters, some of whom have competing interests in that system. And the third difference is that they're not uh, invested with the full power of a traditional ambassador to transact business on behalf of the head of state, what we would normally call I want to, what's the extraordinary and plenipotentiary kinds of rights? Um, that is, treaty-making powers. They don't, they don't tend to have those. They do, however, conform with the requirements of traditional um, diplomatic practice set out in the Vienna Convention on, on Diplomatic Relations from 1961. In Australia's case, what was really interesting about Sir Ninian Stevens' appointment in 1989 was that he was actually the first environment, as far as I can tell, and this came from an, uh, an interview that he gave in person, as far as I can tell, he was the first globally appointed, um, or appointed in the world, environment ambassador. And that happened in Australia, which I find really striking. <laughs> um, he was the only special interest ambassadorial appointment that was made in the first 100 years of Australia's federation. Since then, we've had about eight of them. Um, 
on counterterrorism, uh, countering modern slavery and people smuggling, cyber affairs and critical technology, First Nations people, I think was possibly the most recent, gender equality, human rights and regional health security, all have these kinds of appointments. When Stephen was appointed, uh, the world was going through its own kind of tumult at the time. The Cold War was coming to an end, as, uh, the Berlin Wall had fallen. It was seen by some as a new era in international relations. But interestingly, there were words of caution delivered at the same time. Just as we talked about a foreign affairs issue being released when we were talking about this book, there was a foreign affairs uh, uh, article issued in 1989 by Stanley Hoffman. It was called A New World and Its Troubles. And Stanley Hoffman noted at the time that the world had not moved into an anticipated new phase of peace and quiet. He identified the emergence of environmental issues as a source of potential conflict, particularly between <laughs> advanced and developing economies. And he pleaded, for the, pleaded the case for renewed emphasis on liberal institutionalism over American exceptionalism to address shared concerns regarding the environment. From 1972, with the UN Stockholm, Co Stockholm Conference on Human Environment, through to more recent times, the environment was taking hold on the global agenda. There was a proliferation of international meetings uh, and negotiations, and Australia, with Sir Ninian Stevens appointed, was going to be a part of that. It's interesting, though, that it was Gough Whitlam who was actually behind the appointment of Sir Ninian Stevens. He had been Australia's representative to UNESCO from 1983 to 1986. And through that appointment, he was no stranger to the global environmental agenda, having already signed Australia up to a range of environmental treaties, including the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, for example, as well as the Convention for the Protection of World Cultural and Natural Heritage, and that he signed up to during his earlier term as Prime Minister. But recognising this expanding global environment agenda, he advocated for a special ambassadorial appointment, one that would enable Australia to represent itself more visibly and to engage critically across key arenas. Environmental issues were not just on the global agenda, though. They loomed large at home as well on the domestic landscape with political debates of the time providing a very important backdrop to the creation of this particular role and Ninian and Stevens' appointment to it. You might remember Bob Hawke came into power in 1983 on the back of an election campaign that had resolved to block the construction of the Tasmanian Franklin Dam. He lent on international obligations under the 1972 Convention for the Protection <laughs> of World Cultural and Natural Heritage to defend the Franklin River case. And it was a defining aspect of his prime ministership and a move that relied on reinforcement of Commonwealth powers over the powers and interests of the state at the time. So you can imagine that for Sir Ninian Stephen, having been a High Court judge, dealing with the intricacies of the constitutional powers at the time, looking at the arguments and the debates that were happening between states and, and the federal government, was going to have a certain kind of appeal and so it was against this backdrop he took up the role. I just want to say, and I won't keep going on, I could. I could go on for ages. Um, but you're probably like, that, isn't it? Can I say, though, since that time, we've had 13 individuals appointed to this role of ambassador for the environment or um, sometimes called ambassador for climate change. They include, of course, Penny Wensley. Many of you, some of you in the room might remember Penny as... Uh, Governor of Queensland, thank you. Um, others have included seasoned climate policy specialist Howard Bamsey, a career diplomat, uh, sorry, career diplomat and trade specialist, now head of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Jan Adams, well-known multilateralist Peter Woolcott, who later took on the post of Australian Public Service Commissioner, and Kristen Tilley, who was appointed in 2022 bringing with her a different kind of climate policy expertise and with her appointment in the Commonwealth Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, which is a real demonstration, not just of the shifting nature of the role, it started as a political appointment, today it's a bureaucratic appointment, but also the widening agenda of international policy and the fact that 
to do international policy, you don't just have to be in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. There are a couple of key features that, that I think you can discern about this role, but I'm going to hide those unless you know, pick them in the book for those of you who decide to read it. I think there have been some gaps as well in the way that we have addressed this particular role and some of the conversations that it has provoked. In particular, we've seen a real gap in how our climate ambassadors, who have worked incredibly nimbly in some instances in an excruciatingly, painfully slow global agenda to try and match those windows of opportunity on the international agenda with the domestic. But we have seen a real gap in how we have brought Indigenous voices into that conversation. That's one thing I'd say. Um, and I also think, to some degree, voices of young people. And Helen, I'm looking at you because I know that's in your wheelhouse. So there's a lot of, in terms of diplomacy, and the way that diplomacy in its widest form is about overcoming estrangement um, between strangers, there's a long way to go. But I'll leave it there, Colin. Thank you to the two professors. Now, does anyone have questions? We've got about 10 more minutes, so I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and that's online too, is this? Where's Ben? You. There's someone with a hand up right at the back. Would you like Hi. to ask a question, please? Hi. Um... Can you, you stand up so we can see you and all oh, here? Yes. Good. Um, hi. Uh, you said at the beginning that this book was designed as a guide for policymakers or decision makers. I'm just wondering what what you've done in the publishing of this book or the advertising of it or the marketing of it to get it in front of those people. Um, because we're all <laughs> a, a well-intentioned crowd, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, I wonder how it's getting to the people that it needs to. I'm very old. And so I wrote handwritten notes and posted 50 copies to everyone I could think of that was very important. So Kenny got one. Look, you're on the cover. <laughs> um, all the Pacific ambassadors based in Canberra, um, all our ambassadors based in the Pacific, um, James Larson in the UN, um, a, a whole lot of UN people uh, who were in a key role. You probably know that some of the features coming up uh, at the UN, the Secretary General is trying to focus on this new special envoy for future generations. Had a few copies off to them. I, so basically I just, nothing like a handwritten note and a nice book. Uh, we also did some radio interviews and we're going to basically launch this about 1,900 times mm -hmm. um, around the country. So the big one um, for Brisbane will be at Goma uh, with our Pacific Island uh, Council of Queensland uh, colleagues. Uh, so that'll have a bit of a different flavour. That will be more uh, people from the PICQ speaking back to the book. Um, so that would be great. And I'm going to highly, highly uh, recommend that you hold on to that. And there's also going to be an art exhibition tour that goes along with that to CIS. You get to see Tess on stage, which is always a thrill. Um, so uh, that we will try to do as much as we can with that. We've also... Um, Try to give copies to all the LPCC lead authors that are based in Australia. Um, so it's an interesting thing. They're artifacts, but they express intention. Um, and we're kind of hoping that, you know, at least there's no excuse. There's a literal book on it. Um, the, people, the people who write about defence are very serious defence scholars. So they have kind of networks as well. Um, but I also. Uh, I teach human security at the Australian Defence College. I'm not sure that they all knew about it. And that's the, the leadership group that spent a year at, um, at a big school there. So we do we do what we can. Um, I haven't had anything back from Penny, but Andrew Lee and Jim Chalmers liked it. <laughs> and I think also <laughs> that's a it's a great question because this book is not an end in itself. It's very much about starting a conversation, and I think we were hoping through it to start a different kind of conversation. We were surprised, I think, by the number of people who wanted to be a part of it, including our colleagues from Defence, um, you know, from different outlets and, and including our Pacific Island colleagues. So it's certainly a starting point but not an end point. And, and I think with diplomacy, <laughs> diplomacy is the means and, and we have to keep conversations and dialogue going and bring perspectives to the table. So this is by no means an end point. It's not, co co it's not uh, exhaustive. You have better ideas. Yeah. Can't can't really 
Oh, there will be the donkeys. Also, I appreciate that's pretty old school. <laughs> Could I just ask, in respect of the announcement, the, I was surprised to hear there was an announcement that the Australian government's considering allowing or inviting Pacific peoples to join our defence forces. How do you envisage that'll be received in the Pacific itself? Rob says it's probably better to answer that. I mean, I've seen a little bit of, I mean, they've been sort of floating it for a while now. Um, I presume that they've done it in some, with some sort of consultation with the Pacific. So. I don't think so. Yes, <laughs> you've been invited to provide the answer. Would you like to? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is, Sue's right, this isn't the first time we've had this idea floated. Um, it comes up every now and again. It's, 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 I think it's the third time I've come across it. Um, it speaks to, I, whether in terms of consultation, I don't know how likely that is, that there's been meaningful consultation. Certainly, my colleagues in civil society in places like Fiji and Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea would say that they would be very concerned about a proposal of that type. It kind of has a smack of the commodification of brown labour um, to support objectives of Australia, in this case, um, defence objectives. It's hard to know how Pacific Island countries would benefit from this beyond remittances. So obviously that's the kind of the carrot, if you like, is that people will get paid good money and they can send money back to their families like fruit pickers do, like rugby players do. It doesn't necessarily talk to, speak to some of the downsides that come with that type of engagement. So if you look at the countries in the north of the Pacific, FSM, Marshall Islands, Palau, they, their population, particularly their male population, is overrepresented in the United States Army. It's a very much pathway for them. They're also overrepresented in people that come back from those deployments injured or dead. Um, they struggle to access post-service uh, benefits, whether it's their pensions or medical care or other issues. Similarly, the Fijians that have served in the British Army have had problems where they thought they were accessing citizenship and then that didn't quite work out so there's a lot a lot of issues um i think i think in terms of changing the conversation in australia about the pacific and what it means to be part of the pacific family we need to get beyond the we have a gap let's just look to the pacific to fill that gap there needs to be a much fruit picking australian army yeah a much more nuanced and, and respectful relationship um than, than those sorts of things. So yeah, I think I think that that announcement is disappointing, just like it was the last time it came out. There was a question there. You, the young. Oh yeah. Do you want me to stand? Hmm? You want me to stand? Oh please, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Uh, you said that there were a few chapters on uh, China in the book. I just want to know uh, what do you think might motivate countries in the Pacific Island, like the Solomon Islands, to turn away from Australia and turn more towards China? Oh, that's a good question. That's Tess's chapter, so um, I'm going to But first, I will say, part, out, of the, part of the ADF deal is also to ensure the loyalty of the fighting men of the Pacific, right? So that, that, that has been overtly stated in our parliament uh, by Jackie Lemon. I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this idea is, AUKUS is all designed on the idea that our biggest risk is this Chinese hostility. But what if we're wrong? And what if the biggest risk to us is climate change, mm -hmm. which is where I am, right? Mm -hmm. So we keep having these conversations about what if you're wrong and actually climate change is the biggest risk to Australian lives? You have then done a whole range of incredibly expensive, long-term, locked-in decisions that don't keep us safer. So it's a big punt. It's a big punt to make. But to use Pacific Islanders as instrumental in a bigger chess game, that's the bad part. We, we can't, like this idea that if we if we got Pacific Islanders in our ADF, not only would they fill a gap, but also they'd be loyal to us and not China. It's so uh, instrumentalist in thinking. It's not a neighbour, it's not the way we think of family. 
Uh, it's very Gurkha kind of vibes, right? Like it's very British uh, kind of Lanyal vibes. exploitation. Yeah, <laughs> French foreign religion, that sort of thing. It gives you all those connotations. So it's still not giving the right respect to the Pacific. It's still not in any way dealing with the existential threats that they have. So they are, are, are you know, this we got information as folk that I've spoken to have a range of ideas about China. But they're clear that the thing they're most worried about is climate change. Mm. So we've got to just start saying, what if they're right? Mm. You know, and, and to proceed from that shared kind of understanding. Even if Australia don't, Australians themselves don't always share that view, our National Climate Survey has found that most Australians are worried about climate change, but they're not worried about it yet, mm. the majority of them. So it's something like 30%. I don't think it's a serious issue now. They think it might be a serious issue in 2050. Oh, wow. Can I just Still... one more question coming? Yeah. yeah well, one more, time for one more. Thank you very there. much. Um, in the spirit of the conversation, um, going back to what if climate change is more of a problem than, say, China, Chinese aggression in Taiwan or whatever, um, can I bring up the example of Tuvalu, which you mentioned? Um, there is a scientific report in Nature published in 2018 which surprisingly concluded that over the period from 1980 to 2018, the actual land mass, the area of Tuvalu Islands increased considerably, significantly. Now, believe it or not, that was fact-checked because it is sort of not exactly um, what you might expect with the island sinking. It was fact-checked by the ABC and found to be correct, but it's never been really publicised, but it was correct. So my question to you is, could it be possible that you're ascribing too much of the unfairness, too much of the concern to climate? And there's a fact like that. I'm not sure if you knew about it or your students knew about it, but it's easily checked. Um, could it be that you're actually over-egging the climate thing, perhaps to for your own agenda, which is um, to actually... I'm, I'm not all for climate justice. I just don't believe necessarily that it could all be due to climate. And there may be other injustices you should be writing as well, including, for example, energy insecurity, for example. Very all of them, including China's human rights issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, look, God, I hope I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong. I would love the IPCC report to be wrong. I would love everything I've read about climate impacts in the Pacific and the Torres Strait to be wrong. I don't think they are. I don't, I don't think, given given what we're seeing, I think actually it's worse than we thought. Um, so, and faster than we thought. So I have seen I have seen questions about uh, Tuvalu land mass, but it doesn't deal with issues like um, basically the ability of the soil to grow food and to have um, potable water. And so it's not just about land mass, it's about the ability to live on that land uh, with kind of access to food security and, and potable water, which is the issue. And there's also issues with Incredibly more um, more and worse cyclones on a more regular basis. So it's not just about, I think this is the difficult thing for people, and including Australians. So the ANU just this week has launched a national relocation strategy for Australia that's basically saying, here are the bits of Australia where people are going to have to move. Um, and uh, it's kind of this honest conversation about. Coastal, sea, coastal hazards, which the federal government put out, um, extreme heat, um, access to water, um, cyclonic um, and bushfire risk, a whole range of things where they're saying these communities are at risk. So we know that about Lismore, but there's a whole lot, and we know that about the Torres Strait, but there's a whole lot of other communities that also going to have some real issues. The Pacific have been having those kinds of conversations for a while now. I can see Stefan up the back there. Um, how long have they been having those kind of for a while. A lot longer than we have. Yeah. And I, I think, can I just add something to that point? One of the, the other parts of this book was around recognising in a diplomatic context that the Pacific nations have gained a great deal of traction and heft working together and, and that, that for Australia, when we talk about game plans and, and how should we rethink our diplomatic approach, part of it is how do we listen to the Pacific regional voice, the kind of blue, the call for a blue Pacific, a blue Pacific identity. And that does mean listening to the, the, the various elements in the Pacific have clearly put climate at the forefront of their security concerns. 
on every level. I think part of this is about listening to those voices and those calls. Thank you very much, Professors. Yeah. I'm sorry to cut across you there, but we only have a, an hour's window frame with the uh, online oh, network that we're using. So could you both, could you all thank the two professors? <laughs> But Poppy is going to say something to you about future events. Now, if you enjoyed this conversation and you want to hear more about it, two actionables. Um, one, purchase the book. <laughs> um, there will be um, um, copies at the back there. Right? Much better than Easter eggs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Easter. And um, second actionable, next month uh, we are continuing this conversation with a beautiful group of uh, uh, colleagues from Griffith University and the Griffith Asian Institute. Uh, there will be a panel discussion on a report that they put together and they will be discussing the six issues that they uncovered that will help us unlock the Asian Pacific's uh, global um, uh, sustainable development issues. Uh, and I know Tess will be here. He's one of our colleagues that will be um, in that panel discussion and hopefully all of you and many more. Um, the next month, of course, is uh, very busy. On the 9th, we have this big gathering. And then uh, we continue on the 16th, we have His Excellency Darius Deputies. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong <laughs> and I apologise. Um, about the Lithuanian and Australian Ukraine and a challenging uh, of the ambassador uh, situation of Lithuania to Australia and relationship um, with China. So it's going to be an all-inclusive conversation. And then on the 24th of next month, uh, we're hosting Dr. Michael uh, Fong, who is the... Um, um, he moderated a... Um, a book, and um, he's also will be talking about the blossoming alliance uh, between Australia and Japan. So he's going to give us this his foreign affairs and foreign relations perspective on these topics. So that should also be interesting. And um, so yeah, it's going to be a busy month. Hopefully, we'll see you. And we've got a lot of events coming up. And um, I would also like to agree with Caitlin that it's beautiful to see young, beautiful, fresh. Um, <laughs> audience, it's absolutely fantastic seeing youth engaging with such critical topics. So, uh, and um, again, please put your hands together to congratulate.